Whether you're looking for answers to specific life questions or seeking to become the best version of you possible, welcome to the Mental Breakdown and Psych Reg podcast, where we offer insight, information, and strategies based upon research and years of practice as clinical psychologists. So sit back, have a listen, and get connected with our hosts, Dr. Bernie Wilkinson and Dr. Richard Marshall. Welcome back. Richard, we just finished a fantastic interview with a, a new friend and colleague from uh, England, Dr. Aaron Ballack. Right. He's, he, he's from the United States. Right. Um, and I was sorry he clicked off so quickly after the right. interview because I wanted to ask him yeah. uh, why he emigrated. Um, thoughtful, yeah. smart, but this man can use language as yeah. few people I've ever heard. Yeah. It, it was hard for me to listen to the content, though the content was fascinating. Um, it was hard to listen to the content because he just uses language so beautifully. I mean, right. I, I don't know how... Very precise in what he's saying. Uh, yeah. It feels like you're reading a final draft of something that yeah. has been edited very carefully over time, and he just talks like a final draft. And yeah. It was very impressive uh, listening to him. But the message was good because he's trained as a psychotherapist. Well, right. He's not a psycho... He, he trained not... in, he, he learned a lot of psychodynamics, psycho mm -hmm. um, analytic principles, uh, more of the, it sounds human object or object relations object, yeah. uh, type of, of uh, Jungian. Mm -hmm. um, but he, but he, when he went to England, that's what he studied was, was more of the, more from that uh, right. perspective. Yeah. One of the things that people, um, many people don't realize he's, he has this psychoanalytic Freudian mm -hmm. background. Um, in our country, we, we weren't learn a little about Freud. Right. But if you want to become a Freudian analyst, you don't do that through a university degree. Right. You have to go to an institute. Right. I did. Nahara was an analyst. Right. I didn't realize that. Yeah. It would, he so he knew it. Anna Freud. Right. He, he trained with her. But he trained with her. Right. And this wow. was a psychiatrist that I worked with back at the University of South Florida, and and yes, he 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 trained with her. From what I understand, um, he trained with her. And um, somewhere in Europe, and then Jeez. he uh, came really... here, and he started a he started a psychoanalytic society. A psychoanalytic I wish that would have it would have been very interesting. In Tampa. He did. Mm -hmm. He started an institute. Yeah, the because that's Center. that's where they train. Right. You, you have to go to the institute, right. uh, and it takes a long time, and yep. you have to go through analysis. I didn't realize all that about him. Mm -hmm. I knew he had that background, mm -hmm. but I just thought he practiced sort of generic psychiatry, child right. psychiatry. So, right. but he was an analyst, right? Which wow. what, which is something that makes Dr. Balik so interesting because right. he he trained in some of those things, but he doesn't necessarily consider himself an analyst. He considers right. himself a psychotherapist, and and for those of you who who may not under, um, be able to differentiate that mm -hmm. vocabulary, uh, the the difference is it has to do with you know, the way in which the types of interventions that you attempt and the, the types of interactions you have mm -hmm. with patients and the communications you have with them and stuff like that. Um, it, it's all a matter of really a, a school of thought, uh, the way that you're, right. you're conceptualizing things. Right. And, and most people uh, joke about Freud, mm -hmm. or they just mm -hmm. dismiss him out of hand. I don't. Uh, right. Freud was absolutely brilliant. I mean, he was. Uh, some of these things, he taught us so much. Well, and people don't really realize how integrated his perspectives are in society in in, in in everything we do in every in in comments or, or little phrases that everyone listening to this podcast has said right um there are some of those that come from freud's perspective that's right um you know when, when you refer to someone who is very clean and tidy and, and neat as <laughs> so anal right well that comes from freud right mm -hmm. that was uh part of freud's perspective his mm -hmm. um psychosexual stages of development you have an oral fixation right you know people who eat a lot or smoke right. or who chew on cigars or dip snot you have an oral fixation freud that's right yeah. and oh it's i i didn't realize i was doing it in my un, my subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. that's freud right yeah. and so um, you stand on the shoulders of giants, right. and Freud is a giant. He was, first of all, he was a neurologist. Right. He, you know, he, he was trained as a neurologist, and he knew that the brain... And a hypnotist. Right. right. Which was <laughs> interest, is an interesting and fascinating combination. He was one of the first to use. He learned hypnotism from the person who developed it. Right. And uh, in France, uh, Charcot. And um, so, yeah, he's, he is a giant in this field. He was the first child psychologist. Right. He was the first person to say... Children are not little adults. Right. They're qualitatively different. Right. So um, there's much that that we stand that he's the foundation 
for yeah. much of what we do. Yeah. But Aaron Ballack um, is a psychotherapist and he, and he lives and works in England. Right. And I had to ask, he's a senior lecturer. He's an honorary senior lecturer. Right at the Center of Psychoanalytic Studies at the University of Essex because in these European schools, they do ally themselves with right. um, psychoanalytic uh, right. schools of thought, uh, more so than in the United States, which right. sort of diverse psychology and psychoanalysis. Right. But he's an honorary senior lecturer because much of his work takes place outside the university, right. but he maintains a relationship. Yeah, he's now the director of Still Point Spaces mm -hmm. in, in London. And uh, yeah, it's it, it's he's doing Fantastic work. The, um, I can't wait for you guys to hear what he describes as his with his office. Right. You know, downstairs they do a lot of therapy mm -hmm. and things like that, but upstairs they it, it's a workspace. He right. said for therapists and psychologists to figure out to, to talk about and work on, you know, taking some of these psychological principles and applying it to the real world. Mm -hmm. That's that's fascinating. Right. Yep. But this whole conversation was about social media and and interactions, and we, we joke uh, about. The fact that the interaction between psychoanalysis and psychodynamics and social media, it's interesting how those two worlds would intersect. Uh, mm -hmm. I, he really, I mean, it takes somebody with a mind like his and mm -hmm. talk about a facile mind. Yeah. He certainly has a facile mind. And um, he's been able to apply these principles, psychological yeah. principles, to social media in a way that I've never heard right. before. Yeah. We read about, and, and he said at the beginning of the pot, uh, beginning of the interview, that his work is not about cell phone addiction and right. all that. His his work is the overlap between psychotherapy or therapy, the psychological principles applied to social media. Right. And you you really have to listen to him yeah. uh, explain this relationship. Um, yeah. I, I love the line that social media or the internet or whatever however you want to define it is neither good nor bad nor neutral yeah and that sort of to me set the table for the entire yeah. conversation yeah he's written a couple of books the, the most recent was the psychodynamics of social networking that came out in 2014 mm -hmm. prior to that he wrote one called keep your cool how to deal with life's worries and stress and that came out in 2013 and i want to read that but that's for children no well no that Isn't was that? right Oh, yeah, um, the children's self-help book, Keep yeah. Your Cool. And then then he has a third one coming out called The Little Book of Calm. But that's not out yet, that's, right? That'll come out next, next year. I need to read that. Yeah. Because yeah, I, yeah. I have a book now called Getting to Calm. And I've read it. And it's it's helped. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to that one. But I have to look at this children's book because um, we have a lot of kids yeah. who come in, all ages, mm -hmm. um, who are anxious or mm -hmm. stressed and... Um, so I'm going to read that book and see what he says because he is he is absolutely masterful. Yeah. So really, really rich, um, informative interview. So. Yeah. So definitely check it out. Let us know what you think. Yeah. And um, if you yeah. want to hear him again, or if you want to hear him talk about other topics. Yeah, we're definitely he's, going to have him back on because he's that an was, interesting guy to listen to. And he was fun to talk to you. I think mm -hmm. that we we laughed more than this. We did. We had a good, plus he has a great sense of humor. So yeah. and a good sense of humor. So. He, he wanted to talk about politics a little bit, but <laughs> we chose not to. <laughs> we're not allowed. <laughs> so, all right. Well, that's it. That's all of the okay. introduction here. So, definitely enjoy the podcast. Hi there. Hi, good hey. morning. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. Well, it's good morning for us. It's, it's almost afternoon for you. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's still a reasonable hour for me. It's an unreasonable hour for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 it's great to meet you. And uh, we're very excited to talk to you because I know that uh, well, well, you, you, you specialize in an area and, and talk a lot about an area that that we're very interested in, uh, especially as it relates to, to social media and social networking and, and technology in general. So I, I'm really excited about this this conversation that we're going to have. Great, me too. So, um, but you, well, you had a question first because I'm I'm always confused when we talk to our colleagues from England. These these um, um, titles that you have: honorary senior lecturer. Right. What is an honorary senior? Lecturer? <laughs> I don't know what those mean. It's a it's a nominal title, I suppose. <laughs> so you're um, not real. Okay. Well, what is it? What is a senior lecturer? Uh, so pretty much what you guys would call a professor um, is a is a big promotion over here. So you start off if you're teaching at a university level, you are a lecturer, 
Then mm -hmm. you become a senior lecturer, then you become a professor, and then you become what's called a reader over here. In the, in the U.S., anyone who teaches a university is a professor, aren't they, pretty much? Here well, it's a... it, it, there is a, there's an assistant professor, associate mm -hmm. professor, and full professor. Oh, I see. Okay. So there, there are three. And that, an instructor. Instructor is before that. It's sort of a... Um, but they're frequently not on that track. Right. You know? right. So, the, so the entry-level position is an assistant professor. And then after uh, you get tenure, mm -hmm. you become an associate professor. And if you're advanced one more time, you become a professor, full professor. I see. But all those students still call you professor, whatever, don't they? You still get the, it's easy. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, so they just call you Dan they, or Bob or Laura. <laughs> when, they still, when they still like you, that's what they call you. <laughs> I see. Yeah, if, you're still, if you're still on their good side, they might call you professor. Right. Well, I was a permanent member of staff, uh, and then I left the university, so they made me honorary, which, which means I'm still associated with the university, but I go teach there occasionally, but I'm no longer on staff. Right. Okay. And we have that but that same designation. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's what I thought, that you were on a full-time, and then mm -hmm. you're still affili you're affiliated, but you're no longer full-time. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. And so so you're doing, you're, you're doing uh, more independent work now? Yeah, so at the moment, I, I'm a, a psychotherapist and an author, and I also uh, run the center that I'm in now, which is called Still Point Spaces, where we have uh, consultation rooms downstairs for uh, five therapists. And up here, we have a psychological co-working space where we aim to take psychology out of the consulting room and apply it to real life stuff, which is a, a big passion of mine. Right. That's fantastic. That's yeah. fantastic. Us too. That's what uh, one, of, one of the... Um, things that fascinates what one of the reasons we're interested in your work is this whole notion of taking it outside the office and into uh, the real world mm -hmm. and so we're interested in that as well so so what how did you find yourself in this field in the in the field of psychology and psychotherapy and and working in this area uh, kind of accidentally I accidentally found myself in psychology and then accidentally found myself in social media um, but to be completely honest, I was uh, I was trying to work out. I'm originally from the states, and I was trying to work out a visa situation to stay here in the UK, um, which meant uh, seeking a master's degree, uh, where I read Freud for the first time seriously, not just a, a passing essay to to learn how to you know hate everything he stands for. But to really... <laughs> okay, you've answered my next question. <laughs> <laughs> What's the next question? <laughs> How did I get into Freud, or do I hate everything he stands for? <laughs> no, no, the first. <laughs> yeah, you you had the you had the luxury of being able to really read Freud. Yeah, which I think. And you're um, right. In the states, we're splashed by Freud. You know, we, we get a little smattering, enough to dislike him. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. And we were re reading him quite deeply, and uh, I, I just got very excited about some of the ideas. I mean, you know, I, I agree with a, a great deal of the criticism people miss some of the brilliance and uh so it was really to, to keep my visa and to, to do this master's program i encountered this this guy and i thought oh you can actually do stuff with this you know you can you can apply it so i started my uh, my training the year after that ma um who knows you're who not knows? A, you're not an analyst right you're not a psychoanalyst no, I'm a psychotherapist. Um, my doctorate is in psychoanalysis, so I think oh. I'm a, a psychoanalytic theoretician. Right. Um, I'm not so keen on classical psychoanalytic application anyway. Mm -hmm. I like the theory, not so much the technique. Right, right. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. So, yeah. so it, it, it was yeah. a, you found your way here in a, a, a somewhat of a non-traditional mm -hmm. way. Yes. Well, well, fantastic. Um, and and I, I think that so now that it's starting to some pieces are starting to come together because when we think about your uh, some of your interests and some of the your the writing, you know, the the title of your uh, the title of your book, the, the psychodynamics of social networking, um, you know. Yeah. How'd you get these two things together? You know, it's about, yeah. you read the titles and say, wait a minute, I have to talk to this guy some more because how do you pull these two things together? Well, it's funny when it, when I first uh, launched the book, I said it, it was the, that this book occupied the center of a Venn diagram where the two circles <laughs> like they never overlap. Thank <laughs> so you. I kind of put them together right. to overlap. Right. Um, this is the second accident. Uh, it's it's a, it's a bit tangential, but um, basically, so I have to tell you a little story to tell you how this happened. Sure. Yeah. Um, way back in two thousand five, I was working late in my my 
home, which also was my office in, in North London, and I heard a very strange noise coming out of the corner of uh, my office. Uh, and I went to go check it out, thinking it was probably a mouse or something, and it wasn't. You're getting the very, very brief version of the story, by the way. Uh, it was a giant nine-inch venomous centipede from South America. It was climbing up my wall in my North Islington, my North London flat. So, yeah, it was crazy. It was a really weird, crazy thing. And I, I captured this thing in a Tupperware. I took it to the Natural History Museum the next day to have it identified. Um, the press secretary at the Natural History Museum asked if she could use that story for what I thought was the museum's circular magazine. Um, it went out as a press release that night. In the following day, it was one of the most emailed news stories in the world. Islington psychologist finds giant centipede in apartment. That's basically the gist of it. <laughs> Um, you, so, the, you know, this was an amusing moment that came and went, but of course, Google uh, collected all of these stories about me, and about a year later, those stories were picked up by a client of mine who I was working with clinically who was unaware of that story and provoked a big, big psychological reaction. And uh, this was new, um, you know, therapists weren't we're just starting to be discovered on Google. In a sense, Google was a, a new thing and we weren't prepared for it, particularly the psychodynamic variety where you don't tend to bring a lot of yourself into the consulting room. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a clinical paper about what it means to be discovered on Google. And then that turned into uh, an application of psychoanalysis. And basically I discovered during that, during those sessions with this person that um, these kinds of things were happening between people, not giant centipedes, but sort of, uh, social media or online interventions were happening right across the world, but you didn't have the opportunity of a therapy session to work out the details. So the book is an application of psychoanalytic theory to what's going on on social media, but it's not about therapy or therapists and their clients. It's about what happens in people's minds when they're interacting over an online world. Oh, wow. So that, once again, a, a very a, a, an unusual, a very, uh, <laughs> Circuitous. <laughs> yes. Now wait yeah, a minute. I want to go back to the like... centipede. Yes. <laughs> what about the centipede? Why was that such a news story? It, because it was not an English bug. I mean, this oh, thing okay. this thing came from Central America or or Java or something. Um, you know, it was oh, a right. really unusual. Yeah. Okay. So what year was this? Oh, Two thousand five, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm trying to think of when um, because when you were telling the story, and I'm sorry that this happened. But my immediate thoughts go to uh, Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones, <laughs> when the bounty hunter tried to kill Padme and put those giant centipede-looking things in her room to to try to uh, attack her. And so I was just worried a bounty hunter was. <laughs> right. We're back to Freud. Hey, we're back to Freud. We are actually the Jungians get very excited about the giant centipede changing my life as well, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we know all about them, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's an amazing story. So, so you, but you were practicing then before, uh, mm -hmm. of course, this happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, what, what were you working with stress and, and anxiety and, and those kinds of sort of traditional uh, mental health uh, concerns? prior to sort of you entering into the world, this world of, of social networking? Yeah, I mean, I would say I still do. I'm, I'm still pretty much a general practitioner when it comes to psychotherapy. It's, I would say that the social media is more my research and applications area. So I'm, I'm not particularly interested in working with internet addiction or, or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really interested in applying what, what I learn from, from the clinical situation to the, to the world. Oh, great, great. Yeah. So do you, do you feel that or do, from, your, from your research and, and exploration in social media and social networking, um, do you see a relationship between some of your clinical concerns with, with clients, you know, again, sort of outside of uh, internet addiction and, and, and cell phone addiction and some of those things that people talk mm -hmm. about, um, but outside of those things, do you see very many connections between some of these mental health concerns and, and social media? Well, it's interesting because uh, unless somebody, <clears throat> excuse me, unless somebody is presenting around issues particularly to do with social media, you, you see it as integrated in their lives like, like most anything else. So if there's anxiety, <clears throat> sorry, if there's anxiety, for example, 
um, the story might be about how some of that anxiety occurs through some Facebook interactions. Or if there's a relationship breakdown, somebody might bring some text messages in or show me their phone. So it's so integrated into our daily lives that you don't see it popping up, which I think is so important because when we read about it in the mass media, in a sense, you see it as a social media thing or as a technology thing or as an IT thing, where I think um, it's a psychology thing always expressing itself through various forms of technology and social media. Mm, that's great. Yeah, so, um, so when you're thinking about sort of this overlap, that, that very thin overlap in the Venn diagram between psychodynamics <laughs> and, and social media, um, what, what lies in there? What lies in that in small area, in yeah. that small overlap? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's bigger. I, I think it's bigger than it looks. <laughs> so um, I'm sure I think, it is. Yes. Uh, so you have group psychology, obviously, and I think it, in the individual psychology, you have a lot of ego psychology, and you have a lot of uh, relational psychology. So, so what happens in that overlap is technology enables certain psychological mechanisms to thrive, and other ones not to thrive so much. And depending on which social network you on, I will invite different parts of your psychology. So if you take the big ones, the Twitter and Facebook, probably, um, that's where we talk about ego psychology. It's how we show up in a virtual public environment to others and what those concerns are, what those vulnerabilities are, and where the, uh, um, where the attention is focused and then where there are, in a sense, shadows because there's no attention on those things. Yeah. I have a related question, and I've, and I've wondered about this, and, and your work has really um, helped for me to focus the question. If you think about how Freud and others talk about the ego, social media allows us to create, recreate ourselves or to create a version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. does it, does, how does that affect, how would Freud have interpreted that? I mean, what would he, you know, because now we have this ability that has only recently existed. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I tend to read it more through Winnicott and Jung, actually, but I, I do use it. So the Freud's, Freud's ego, in a sense, and the, the Freudian part is how the ego is the synthesizer and mitigator between the internal and the external worlds. Right. That's the main Freudian piece. Mm -hmm. So when you go onto Facebook and you're making unconscious or semi-conscious decisions about how you represent your how you represent yourself on there it's a very freudian ego thing so you, you know we have all these conflicts inside and we decide these are the bits i'm going to share um if you want to go down freud's sort of darwinian streak in a sense you say you know i'm going to share things that make me more um attractive right. to others in a sense right. all of this being quite unconscious but I think what, what Winnicott brings to the scene is that that idea that it's not there's not just one psychology in the room developing in a world of objects, but that there's a requirement for relationship there as well. Right. And the development of a false self, which is an aspect of ego um, that is dedicated to uh, presenting to others what they want from you. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you have ego from Freud and then you have false self development from Winnicott, which I think really fits into that that Venn diagram bit very well. You know, how, how can I best, how can I meet my ego needs best through relationships with others? So, so there are two things occurring simultaneously. Yeah. I'm shaping my ego, I'm designing my ego, but I'm doing it for relational purposes. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then there are consequences of that in a sense. So the same consequences as in, in real life, except they're a little bit more concrete out there in the real world. Mm -hmm. And we know from Winnicott's work that, uh, false self is a, is a perfectly normal, fine, adaptive thing to have. Right. But when you believe that false self to be the whole of yourself, you get into big trouble because it's just a representation. And that's what I think starts to happen in lots of social media, particularly with younger people who are growing up in it and developing a, a historical false self in a sense, you yes. know, yeah. mm -hmm. that, that's, that's immediately where I was thinking is that, you know, we think of adolescence as this time when our our personalities and our who we are really begins to to formulate and to gel and to to formalize and so many teens and preteens spend so much time creating this this self this identifying um 
body through social media. Mm -hmm. I wonder how that might influence their actual, uh, the development of their actual identity. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I, th I think there are opportunities there. You know, there are opportunities to create a self online with a kind of creativity that perhaps wasn't available to me when I was younger. There, there, there's accessibility to different kinds of communities that you might not find locally um, if you're a young person. So you can reach out to people who share your interest in graphic novels or, or you know, Star Wars or whatever your, your interest might be that, you know, might not be shared around you. Um, but the, the same danger exists as does in any local, say, home situation. Um, if you have parents who have who need you to be something for them, um, you know, they need you to excel academically or need you to be athletic or whatever it is. So you learn to provide for them what they need and then you you hide the parts of yourself that you feel are unacceptable. Um, you imagine this going on online over years and years and years. What happens to those bits of ourselves that we feel vulnerable about that um, we we don't feel will attract the the you know the the kindness of others um they don't they might not get a chance to bloom yeah. now um related to that i have four children um the the second three the second three the three youngest range in age from 24 to 18. Mm -hmm. the 18 year old has created a an internet self mm -hmm. because she grew up with it the 24 year old didn't, he, he had a self and then the internet came and, and uh, social media came along and then he shaped uh, through social media what, what he had become to that point. But mm -hmm. the youngest, my youngest child has really created this from almost from birth. Mm -hmm. She has created this in itself. At some point she has to leave that and function in the real world. Mm -hmm. Is that a transition that is made more difficult by social media? Well, I think it really depends because the, they don't tend to happen exclusively in mutual exclusive ways. So there, there does tend to be a link, but depending again, you always have to ask what kind of social media and what kind of online self and you know, how is it being expressed and who's it being expressed with? Because there isn't one answer. Um, you could, I mean, I don't know if people even use it anymore, but you can think of something like Second Life or one of these sort of virtual worlds where you can really create a self that's very disconnected from how you present yourself in the world, um, which can be a very interesting exercise in self-exploration on the one hand, mm -hmm. or you can be locked into um, a fantasy world on the other. You, you, you can't know if it's healthy or unhealthy until you really look at the details. So um, it's, yeah. Yeah. So it's it sort of enhances, you know, Robert Marcia, talks about, or James Marcia talks about that, um, the exploration that teens do, um, and then they make a commitment based on the exploration. Mm -hmm. so social media would be another way to experience that exploration. You're, you're exploring different parts of yourself. It, it could be that the trouble is what you were kind of speaking about before is the locked in bit. You know, I, I know that I had a big transformation between junior high and high school. You know, junior high was terrible for me. I changed schools, lots of people changed. And I had the opportunity to start again. And I was still who I was, but I didn't have to bring my, you know, my reputation with me in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you have particularly like a, a Facebook profile with all of those friends on it that follows you from one stage to the next, that kind of concretizes an experience that maybe that's, makes you, mm -hmm. yeah, commit before you're ready in a sense. Right. And that's how it feels with my youngest daughter is that she's as committed to this um, creation mm -hmm. that she's had as she is to, um, being my daughter, if you yeah, will, sure. the, the child I wanted to create, right? Mm -hmm. And she's created this avatar. Would that be the right? You know? nice. I'm still learning, nice learning. you know. Yeah, nice yeah. 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 And, and you know, there's the, the, there's a, a, a role, you know, on, on the one hand, you might be quite nervous about that. On the other hand, um, if you could, I know it's difficult being the father, but sort of step into a space of kind of curiosity about these different expressions of, mm -hmm. they're different expressions of who she is. Right. Um, before the internet came, you know, particularly with teenagers, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole aspect of life that parents are unaware of, um, that they'd be terrified by. Fortunately. <laughs> yes. That, that, you know, yeah, fortunately you, you didn't get to, to, to see. Right. So I, I think. Until you start doing a podcast and you talk about your childhood and then <laughs> right. you out and mama asks you all kinds of things. Did you really do that? Huh? <laughs> yeah. And they're like, dad. <laughs> Oh, oh man. <laughs> yeah. But multiple personas 
you know, again, you can't, you can't say, you have to look at each individual case. Every, everybody has a multiple persona. Sure, you know, yeah. they behave and seem one way in one condition and another way in another condition. Well, you know, it, it makes me think back to, uh, in, in, a, in a previous life, I worked at the university full-time in the College of Medicine, and one of the psychiatrists that I worked with, uh, he, he was a, an analyst, and he, mm -hmm. you know, like a, 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 almost a purist, he, he trained with Anna Freud, and he, uh, and he, so he was very, very into, he started a, a, a psychoanalytic society in our area and everything. Uh, but he, he was very interested in ADHD. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how those things connect necessarily, but, uh, but he was very interested in ADHD. And when people would talk, when parents would talk to him about taking the medication, you know, we know that stimulant medications, for example, you can not take it on the weekends and, uh, you know, on summers and, and things like that. You can take these medication holidays. And he always talked about, when you do that, you're creating two selves. You're creating two identities where the kid is, you know, on the medication, they're one There's self, one and then on mm -hmm. the off the medication, they're another self. And, you know, of course, he was really concerned about that as a, as, as a therapist, but also certainly as an analyst. And I, I had not really thought about it in the same sense with the, with the social media until we're having this conversation that we do have the possibility of the, developing these two identities. And, uh, the resilience, I guess, is an interesting phenomenon as it relates to how a, a youth is able to differentiate and, and sustain their real self despite their online persona. Mm -hmm. well, well, see, I would, I would take a slightly different angle and, and say that, that, that that's not, I think that's a false distinction between a real self and an online persona. Yeah, that mm -hmm. I think the online persona is an aspect of real self. Just as in Winnicott's idea of false self, the, the, the one who wants to keep the parents satisfied, that's still done in a very creative way. You know, you might do that through humor or you might do that through being um, really smart or you might do that through being uh, you know, drawing negative attention. But whatever the choice is, it's still a very creative personal choice. So I don't like the expression false self for that reason, because I think it's a creative, reactive self. Right. So we have to step back and say there is real self informing all of these personae, so, which is probably where I depart. I mean, when you bring in um, Ritalin and that sort of thing, I think we're into a different kind of a field, but sure, there would sure. still be aspects um, of what is essentially a, a, a multiple kind of a self underneath. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a great point because I think, because you're right, we, we can't, we don't manifest something that's not within us. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, if you mm -hmm. if you have this online, um, you know, let's let's just use a, a strange example of you know a, aggression. If you're if you're a bully online, but you seem to be this nice, sweet person uh, to your to your family and to everyone else in person, but you're this bully and you're this aggressive person. Those tendencies, those those <laughs> feelings and thoughts, and everything are still within you. It's a it's an aspect of you that you maybe inhibit. Um, you know, in face-to-face -face in interactions in, in, in one context, context. but right. it's still there. It's still a part of you. So it's not false in that sense. That's right. And that's, a, that's one of the really interesting things that social media activates in our psychology. So like the online disinhibition effect. And again, we can draw on Freud here, you know, um, we all have antisocial tendencies that we tend to civilize out of the way. Um, but you get that direct social opprobrium out of the way, you know, where you, you you basically rip somebody apart in front of a group of people who then, you know, lay into you for doing it to, to maintain a you know social cohesion. Um, you go onto Twitter where you, you don't get that kind of opprobrium. You do get feedback, but, you know, low complexity feedback. So you're kind of allowed to um, express some of those maybe more aggressive negative traits than you would in, in normal circumstances. But you're, you're exactly right. They are there. You're just, um, you just tend not to express them. Yeah, that's a, that would be um, fascinating. I don't, I'm not, I don't think we, I asked what population, what group of, um, you know, what age groups and things like that that you work with therapeutically, but we work with children and adult and teenagers and adults and you know, sort of the broad spectrum. And, you know, that's certainly an interesting conversation that we've had with parents before, you know, where they, they talk about, you know, what, when I read her, you know, her messages on Instagram, they, they don't sound, it doesn't sound like my daughter at all. I don't know who she's trying to be or what she's trying to do. And mm -hmm. I guess that's a new kind of conversation that we have to have that, yes, there, some of that is in there. We, we mm -hmm. just have to right. figure out why it's, expressing there uh, 
perhaps because it's safer and less less social implications, perhaps. But uh, yeah, that's an interesting perspective. And and I think that's the curiosity that 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 parents struggle to, but need to bring on board in a sense, because it's it's much easier to do kind of the splitting and say, um, that's not my daughter on Instagram. That's my daughter. You know, I that's the sweet girl. You know, I know from home. <laughs> it's kind of like. Right. Okay, both of those things are, and you know that that Instagram thing might be a symptom of distress. You know, it doesn't have to be who who she is, but to hold a place of curiosity and say, "Tell me about who this girl is expressing herself on Instagram that I don't recognize." You know, right. what's I'm really curious, rather than you know trying to shut it down. Yeah, right. that's fascinating. <laughs> so, over the over the last couple of days, we've we've been reading some different things about social media and in, you know, and we've kind of even been talking about it here already. There's certainly a lot of pros and cons to, to social media and this access. And I, and I saw your, your YouTube and I'll, I'll take that link and, and, and put it in the show notes uh, of this, of the podcast here, but your, the link of your um, YouTube lecture on, um, <laughs> you had this, this brilliant, um, connection when in talking about the impact of social media with you know Brexit and with the the 2016 presidential election here in the United <laughs> States and the impact of social media on those massive you know world changing national changing uh, events mm -hmm. and I wonder you know with all of this potential negativity that comes from social media that that 24 hour access that constant bombardment of information and stimulation from from the outside world what what effect might that have on development on the identity and in, in, in these different psychological aspects yeah i mean it's a it's a really good question for, um complex answer i think but i i think the the standout for me is something to do with um attention and processing so in a sense what happened and i think it and it's the hardware too right so um before smartphones came out you know uh, facebook predated smartphones as did twitter actually but uh <clears throat> you know between work and home you know <laughs> between desktop and laptop in a sense there was a break if you get if you get what i'm saying now right. you know we've got we've got this thing like all the time so in a sense, our attention levels are quite ADHD. So we're flipping from one thing to the next. We're becoming emotionally responsive. The group dynamic across things like Twitter, 24 hour news, Facebook, and that sort of thing is a, is a group hysteric reaction, I think. I think we're kind of in this constant group hysteric state. And, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm, I don't divorce myself from that. I'm looking at my news app all the time these days. Um, but what that does is it takes you away from deeper consideration of things. So rather than being impacted by something, a piece of news, in which case you would need to depend on a critical facility to work out the details, what that means, take some time, expend some brain energy to do that. Um, you don't have to, you can jump to the comment section or jump to another news story or write a comment or, or forward a tweet. If you, so it all kind of stays up here so I think it pre prevents us from dropping down. And I think it's not an accident that you, you find the concurrent rise in the mindfulness movement during the growth of all of the social media, because I think, you know, that, that pendulum is people are becoming aware that it's swung so far up this way. They're trying to pull it back and say, well, how can I, how can I have quiet moments? How can I have considered moments? You know, so it's yeah. a surface level reaction, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, and so much of it is surface level, and I, I think that we find circumstances, situations where where individuals then make decisions based upon this sort of superficial information, yeah. and mm -hmm. and they 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 rise to conclusions and and they develop opinions based upon incomplete at best information, mm -hmm. and and you know there, there's. Well, there's examples almost in the news every day where you, you get one piece of information and then you you know you wait six hours or you click on a couple of uh, additional links and you find out that all that information was incorrect, mm -hmm. and and it really does impact the way in which we interact. But it, I think I've seen in my practice a, a significant increase even in anxiety as it relates to some of that. Mm -hmm. Do, does it seem to be 
you know, I, I, I would assume that it's sort of the same kind of dynamics over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole thing is, I think it's anxiety provoking. Um, but I think the paradox is it's also it, it also provokes a kind of a pleasure. So you know you get the you get the dopamine hits of all of the notifications and all the looking around and the distraction and that sort of thing. And it, so you get anxiety and excitement at the same time. So I think people are kind of um, they're hyper aroused. You know they're continually hyper aroused, um, which is not the best position in which to be making very important decisions about you know the world. Um, and I think that's what happened here around Brexit. I think there was, and it wasn't just accidental. You know, I think there was um, a push to to, to hyper arouse people uh, to make an emotional decision on a very very complex thing that, in a sense, never should have been a. I mean, now we're getting into politics, but never never should have been a yes or no vote by by the the public. You know, it's, there's too much. We're discovering it all now. There's too much going on, but you rile people up. You make them afraid. Um, don't make a choice, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I saw you making notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we're not going to get into politics, right? Okay. <laughs> it was like, this bit's yeah. coming out. <laughs> yeah, you, you could feel me coming out of this, right? <laughs> He's starting to rise out of his chair. Mm -hmm. so, okay, I'll calm down. I'll, I'll, I'll be less aroused now that we're back to uh, academics. Yes, yes. So, so but you're right, and, that, and that's exactly what's happening in our country, in in the United States today, mm -hmm. is that people are kept in this hyper aroused state, and they're making emotional decisions based on um, fragments of information, some of which are true and some uh, which aren't true. Yeah, and I understand from my colleagues over there that it's very hard for people to talk to each other about oh, about politics. Like it's just it's dangerous. It's very very dangerous. It's become. Yeah. Yeah, it's you, there are just certain topics that that you just don't bring up right. when you're in, when you're with uh, even with friends, because right. these these divisions are getting deeper and wider. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and, and as you as you pointed out, I th I think in your in that YouTube video that that you sent me, the uh, the, the 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 sad fact is that you know people who maintain a particular perspective tend to only expose themselves to information that support that general perspective and so they don't hear both sides they don't mm -hmm. hear you know the inaccuracies or the the, the, the false uh, messages in some of those uh, some of that information and so they they just get deeply rooted in you know this superficial level of information yeah and here's the problem both personally and socially i think so in a, in a way we're talking about the power of confirmation bias you know we all have our world view and then we select the things unconsciously mostly that that kind of support our world view um and in order for a world view in order for one's worldview to change, it has to hurt, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. you have to yeah. be impact, you have to be properly impacted. Allow yourself to be, right. and it's almost like being punched in the gut. You know, like if you really want to allow that person's worldview to to enter yours, you have to allow yourself to be impacted by it. And what we're seeing at the moment, and again, same old psychology through different deployments, is on the personal level, people are protected from that impact by their filter bubbles, and then on the social level, the same thing is happening. So in order to opt yourself into a position to be, to have your worldview changed or nudged, you have to make yourself very vulnerable, you know, to changing your mind or saying that you are wrong. Um, and we, we don't, and I think partially because of social media and technology, not exclusively, uh, we live in a world where that becomes much more difficult. Yeah, people are very resistant to that discomfort. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we've, we've talked about that a number of times in, in different podcasts in the past because you know, change, change requires, you know, uh, uncomfortable feelings. It requires you to sort of venture outside of your comfort zone. And right. uh, a lot of people prefer to remain very rooted in, in their comfort zone. They don't, they don't want to stretch those boundaries very much at all. We're right back to Freud again and the pleasure principle, aren't we? we, we, we do. That's another job of the ego to avoid unpleasure and to seek pleasure. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, when you're when you're working with clients uh, or patients, and you are you, you know you see you, you know say you say have a patient with with anxiety or a patient who's struggling with maybe even anger or, or irritability, and and you see that one of their one of the sources of that is social media or some of the social this technology. Mm -hmm. What type of like what do you typically recommend for for individuals dealing with that? You know. It, 
I, I think of, especially about teenagers because you can't say we'll just d get disconnected because <laughs> that's not going to happen. You know, teenagers are not going to disconnect. Uh, so what, what kind of recommendations do you often recommend? Well, in, in some ways I do, I mean, for, okay, it, yeah, it's different for teenagers and adults and unusually from someone with a psychoanalytic disposition, I actually am quite behavioral about that. Like, you know, there, there are some times um, where someone will come in distressed with their, their time on social media, where it seems like, you know, every time you access this, you know, you tell me how unhappy you are. So maybe we really ought to think about basic behavioral interventions here, you know, log off, you know, take the app off your phone, right. um, decide when you're going to go on. Like, for example, I, I, do, I no longer can receive emails on my, on my smartphone and all of my notifications are off because I noticed that uh, when I was on a bus, you know, I would check my emails, I'd find something I didn't want to read, I would get anxious about it, and then I couldn't respond to it because you can't respond to an email on a phone and, you know, so why, why would I subject myself to that kind of anxiety until I'm in a position to be able to respond to it? So asking yourself those questions. Um, I think on a more psychological level with younger people, um, there's a bit of psychoeducation that needs to go on in a sense, like uh, the fact that your online persona isn't the whole you, the fact that when people, um, to use an expression we use over here, you know, take the piss, <laughs> uh, which is to, you know, take, take you down or insult you, um, that, that part of that is about their projection and that they're objectifying it, you don't have to use these kinds of words, but in a sense to put that social media world in perspective. Developmentally, that's very difficult, particularly if you're going like 16 and under, because there's a real felt mm -hmm. equivalence of an online self and a, and a real self. You, you, you can't say, you know, we all know, all our parents said, didn't they, you know, oh, if, if someone bullies you, they're just jealous of you. And it's like, yeah, but they're bullying. <laughs> I don't care what the source of <laughs> it is. A, they're not jealous. B, they hit me every day. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't help. That's right. <laughs> so I think, you know, compassionate support. Um, but yeah, I do think that reasonable behavioral intervention as well. That, that, yeah. that, that, that makes good sense. And, you know, I, I do have a couple of people that I work with who are who are on the other end of the spectrum, who are 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 so anxious about the information coming in that they, you know, are unable to check email, are unable, mm -hmm. you know, they don't do text messaging even. They they are completely disconnected from all social media. Mm -hmm. And and you know the, well, I, I don't want to to I, I would love to hear your thoughts about it, but I, I feel that there's, you know, certainly social and uh, relational implications to that extreme as well. Yeah. Well, I, I like, um, I think he's Kranzberg, a, a quote, he said, you know, the technology is neither bad nor good, nor is it neutral. And, <laughs> and it's really, it's really helpful. And you, you have to look at each instance and decide what's going on there. Like, you know, I work with lots of um, traditional psychoanalytic types who won't touch social media at all um, because it's bad and it's, you know, it's not real relationships. And I think there's a lot of fantasy on their side as well, where I say, you know, th this is actually your anxious reaction and maybe you ought to consider exploring it or exploring why you're so anxious about it. And it doesn't enforce you to get a Facebook profile, but, you know, we live in a world where this is, this is people's experience and it might help to know a bit more about it. You have people years ago or still, you know, who won't open their post when it comes to the door. It doesn't have to be an email, you know. Um, so you have to you have to look at the nature of that anxiety and make some kind of decision about whether someone's making a a choice about the kind of world they wish to engage in, or whether anxiety is shutting down thinking and therefore limiting them in some important way. In which case, you work with the anxiety. That's, that's yeah. good. Good, right? Yeah. Good information. Now. Do you use social media very much in your practice? Uh, not in my practice. No, I mean, personally, I do. Like, I, I enjoy, you know, my, my Facebook and, uh, and my Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't work, uh, not, no, not, not, not like as a, not as a psychotherapist. Okay. Yeah, we're, that's, that's starting to become, that's gaining some interest uh, from what I've seen in some of the, some, articles and stuff where, where therapists are starting to use uh, and psychologists are starting to use social media as a way to interact with patients and remain mm -hmm. in contact and connected to patients and 
I haven't met anyone who's actually using it yet, but I, I've certainly mm -hmm. read about people using it. So, right. yeah, I mean, I think accessibility is a very important thing, and I think you know we, we probably all, all three of us, and probably most of your listeners know that the the last person you're going to get voluntarily walking into a counselor, or a therapist office is a young man or or an, an older man, really. You know, let's say between fifteen and forty, uh, more right. perhaps. You know. Um, but uh, if somebody can access a psychological mind through um, a message portal or a text message or some kind of social media um, and make that start of that relationship, I think we, you know, we, we ought to meet people where they are as much as we can. But I also think that um, that face-to-face -face interpersonal complexity is very, very important in the psychological process. And uh, though I've worked by video conferencing and that sort of thing, um, I still really prefer to have people in the room. And I think all of those unconscious cues of, you know, in present interaction, very, very important. I agree. I agree. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the um, pro podcasts that we just did was a, we, we, we did a commentary on a, a YouTube, no, a TED talk by mm -hmm. uh, Sherry Turkle. Mm -hmm. And she's written that book uh, alone together. Yeah. Uh, the effects of social and you know, I'm, I'm you probably know about her. One of the comments that she made that has stuck with me, she said that social media sanitizes and tries to, and seeks to simplify these complex interactions that we have with others. Do you see it? Do you see it as a simplification or is it something different altogether? She yes. says conversations are messy when, mm -hmm. when you're and you, you, you talked about that a few minutes ago, that mm -hmm. when you're conversing with somebody, uh, it can be messy. And, and mm -hmm. we, we, um, we shape each other's behaviors. You know, we don't do these things in public. We do them on Twitter. Yeah. So, so it allows us to sanitize um, complex interactions. Do you see it as sanitizing or is it different? Uh, I probably wouldn't use the word sanitizing. So I, I go back to the quote from before, you know, not good, not bad, not neutral. And the question right. is, what kind of non-neutrality is, is it mediating? So I'd use the word mediate, yeah? Uh, so Facebook mediates relationships in a, in a variety of ways. So you have to look at the architecture of how Facebook works to understand how it's mediating my relationship with others. So where I would agree completely with Sherry Turkle is that whatever social media platform you're on, you have a reduction of complexity. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the background, you don't have the, you know, the body language, some of the body language, all, all of that kind of thing. So it does enable us to objectify others and to not get the full information. Mm -hmm. um, you might think of a social media platform that could be developed, or I'm sure there are some, where um, you might, uh, you know, like a anonymous uh, support networks. And I know we have some here mm -hmm. for young people, mental health message boards. Um, where you get yourself an avatar and you talk about the stuff that you can't talk to your parents or your friends about because you're too ashamed of it. And then there's a support person on the other end, in which case you can say that the, the mediation is a positive one because it enables something to happen that couldn't happen before. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I wouldn't, again, you always have to look at how it's being activated across what to find out what's happening there. Yeah, that, that that's, reminds me of a, a, an what article that we were talking about the other day uh, Lady Gaga has a has a foundation very interested in. I think it's called Born This Way. Born This Way, and mm -hmm. it's very, she's very interested in, in mental health and, and everything. And they did a survey, and they found that a significant portion uh, of young adults, it was eighteen to twenty four year olds. Yeah. I think it was like seventy percent of eighteen to twenty four year olds use social media as a way to talk about and interact with others as it relates to social media, uh, as it relates to mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, again, a significant portion of them said that they would rather do that than even talk to a parent or a loved one. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I agree. I think that some, some platform of that sort of, of some uh, of a social media, um, <clears throat> variety, could be a very good way right. to to increase access uh, to those who maybe wouldn't otherwise access mental health services. I, I think that's right, and I think th then we have um, we have an opportunity in a, in a problem there in a sense because um, people you know people with eating disorders, for example, can also access you know pro Anna websites that teach them how to starve themselves more. 
um, or they could access a supportive website that, that tells them how to deal with the, with the condition. And what I often say about Facebook is Facebook is generally reflective of people's real life social world. So if you live in a social environment in which um, your friends undermine and take you down and bully you, it's going to look that way on Facebook. If you surround yourself with supportive, nurturing, so, you know, real life social network, you go onto Facebook, you talk about a job promotion, everybody says congratulations, they don't attack you with envy. So um, it's also about, in a sense, reaching those people who don't know how or don't have the skills or are looking in the wrong places to seek support rather than um, re looking in the wrong places, in a sense, which is very easy to do also. Yeah, no, that makes sense. True. So, yep. um, we have covered like a lot of terrain in this conversation today. <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything else that we, we haven't talked about that you, um, like a, a message that you, you wanted to get out that we haven't talked about? American politics. No, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need more coffee. <laughs> We're going to need to start back. It's, a, it's early in the morning for you guys anyway. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. I'm awake now. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll, we'll stay away from that. Um, I don't know. I feel like we've, we've, uh, we've done a pretty wide spectrum, actually. Um, I'm sure once we click off, I'll think of a thousand things. But, but right now, um, it feels like we covered a lot of ground. You guys have some really interesting questions. Fantastic. Well, um, I will... I'll certainly put links to some of these things, but how how could folks follow you to see you know more about what you're what you're um, writing about, what you're studying, uh, and more about you? Okay, uh, well, I am an avid uh, tweeter, so you can uh, follow me on Twitter at uh, Dr. Aaron B. D R A A R O N B. Um, there's also a, a professional Facebook page that I have, um, and obviously my website, which is AaronBalick.com. Fantastic. Again, I'll put those links in the show notes and certainly encourage everyone to, to follow. And, and I, I mentioned it earlier, um, but I should have probably made sure that it was cool that I posted that YouTube uh, link in uh, the show notes oh, yeah. so that folks could watch that. Okay. Um, I, I always forget about the, the, the possibility of, you know, sort of um, private or, you know, unlisted YouTube yeah. <laughs> links. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a public talk, so that's absolutely fine. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, well, we definitely appreciate the, yeah. the conversation this morning, and um, you are you're certainly welcome back anytime. So after we click off, if you have more of those thoughts, uh, we we're definitely um, happy to talk again, and okay. have you want to talk more about other things. Well, thanks very much for having me. I really enjoyed it, and right, uh, I wish you guys the best uh, for um, Irma. You got some. Yes. Are you like are you gonna need to block up windows and that sort of thing? Are you you're not quite there yet? That, mm. they, they say that we are. They, we I have well, we certainly have patients who are doing that. But but yes, there there are there are tracks that have it coming through us and 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 being very pretty close to us with about a 120 mile an hour winds by the time it still reaches us. Wow. So, um, and are you like yeah. panhandle or are you um, peninsular? Central. Central. Yeah, we're, we're right in okay. the, right in between Tampa and Orlando. So oh, I see. right in that little, right in the middle. So we have some cushion. Yeah. We're yeah. not on it'll, the it'll, it'll weaken a little bit before it gets to you. It should. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll be thinking about you guys. Good, good luck. Appreciate well, it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a, have a great day. And, and again, thanks so much for coming on. Okay, great. And now uh, drop me the link when you go, when you go live. I absolutely will. Okay. Thanks. Right. Bye, guys. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.